Thank you so much. Uh, we're going to be hearing about uh, Citizens Climate International, and uh, Cedric Jello from Ghana is one of those people from CCI. So could you give, please give him a big CCI welcome? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. As Riley said, my name is Cedric Jelou from Ghana, and I bring you warm greetings from Ghana and across Africa. Riley so because we are equally impacted by the climate crisis. In Ghana, up north, we are confronted with drought. From the Middle Bay toward the south, we are constantly hit by floods. And along parts of the coast, the sea level rise is ravaging lives and properties, destroying schools and homes. So we will have our own share of the climate crisis to solve. And it is for this reason that we identify with you and your work, believing that the work of lobbies like you has a role to play in mobilizing government, corporates, and individuals to confront our shared responsibility in addressing the climate crisis. And so I stand in solidarity with you that we are proud of what you are doing. We are learning so much for you. And the educational program that you organize through the monthly course is a great benefit to many, many young people in Ghana and across Africa. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, Joseph Robertson is the executive director for Citizens Climate International, and I just want to tell you a little bit about uh, what kind of orients the way he does his work. Joe attended Holy Cross uh, Grammar School in Rumson, New Jersey. When he was in sixth grade, uh, Sister Lorraine offered a class in genetics, so Joe was one of 10 kids who signed up. And one day, Sister Lorraine said, I'm gonna draw everybody's blood. So she went around the class and drew 10 kids' blood, and then she said, I need someone to volunteer to draw my blood. Joe said all 10 kids took one big step backwards. <laughs> so she, of course, called on Joe Robertson. He said what probably took 10 seconds seemed like 30 minutes for him, which was the most nerve-wracking thing that had ever happened in his life at this point, something he had nothing idea about, to do about, no experience, no background. He's now going to take Sister Lorraine's blood. So reflecting over the years, what has really settled deeply with Joe was that here was this nun who was trusting Joe at a level he couldn't imagine. And so what he took and how he built that into CCI is he said, you know, most of these leaders around the world, I don't meet them, I don't get to see them, but I can learn to trust them the way that Sister Lorraine trusted me. So here's, let's hear from CCI. Greetings from Bonn, Germany, where the United Nations climate change negotiations are currently ongoing. I'm really sorry I can't be with you in Washington, D.C. this time. It's one of my favorite things in life to be with hundreds of citizens climate lobby volunteers and staff. So many of you are like family to me. I miss you and I can't wait to see you again. A little context about the world surrounding these talks. In February, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reported that 3.3 to 3.6 billion people are now or will soon be facing severe and ongoing vulnerability to serious climate impacts. The window for successful climate resilient development is rapidly closing. Those 3.6 billion people who live in the least developed countries, but also in vulnerable places in the most developed, need policy to catch up with science. The Glasgow Pact, which was agreed last November in Scotland by 196 countries calls for aligning international finance with climate goals. That's policy catching up with science. That's 196 countries saying we can do better and we will do better. But in order to do what they're calling for, all of these countries are going to have to follow stricter rules than they ever did before. Rich countries are going to have to live up to their commitments defend the internationally recognized human right to a clean and healthy environment and work seriously towards climate safety and security. This is not theoretical. The United Nations has established a global crisis response group on food, energy, and finance. 
we cause disruption of climate patterns, watershed, biodiversity, and ecosystems has made it harder to produce food. This background of climate degradation is one of the reasons we have higher prices for so many things. Another is how energy sources that drive climate change are priced and who pockets the money. Supply chain disruptions are causing havoc and the invasion of Ukraine shutting down food production and export from one of the world's breadbasket countries means we're now facing a global food crisis and it's getting worse. Hundreds of millions more people will likely face food insecurity by the end of this year. The number of countries unable to feed themselves without significant food aid is rising. The Global Crisis Response Group is tasked with figuring out how to enact emergency measures to address this urgent crisis, save lives, and prevent countries falling into chaos, and do all of that without locking in damaging incentives and practices that will make it impossible to meet climate goals, develop sustainably, or meaningfully safeguard human rights in the future. We have citizen volunteers who face these kind of threats, extreme climate vulnerability, food scarcity, political violence, even state-sponsored persecution of people who advocate for climate safety and human rights. We started Citizens Climate International to bring the CCL citizen empowerment model to the world in a way that meets the needs of volunteers in all variety of unique circumstances around the world. We believe everyone's chances of success, including governments and industry, are enhanced when the design of our world is shaped by the needs and aspirations of all people. This requires active, flexible, safe, and inclusive spaces for open civic participation. A Ukrainian climate activist, Olya Boyko, joined our Earth Day Citizens Forum in April from Western Ukraine. She urged us all to recognize that adaptive capacity isn't an authoritarian strength. It is a strength of open and cooperative society. Her message was, build civil society in your countries like your lives depend on it. We now train and coordinate volunteers in 76 countries across six continents. June is our first global month of action. Volunteers are focusing on the five levers of political will and on tools and trainings for volunteer and group development to discover some of the same strategies you use to learn together, to keep growing, to persist against the challenges that always face the world's determined optimists, and to do the hard work of building political will in the right way. I'm going to ask Kathy Orlando, CCI Program Director, to share a little more about what's happening in Canada and around the world. Kathy? And here's a brief report from Canada. In May, for the first time since 2019, we went to Parliament Hill to lobby and we had a small conference. It was small because COVID was still surging and so was influenza. And there was also a massive biker rally in the parliamentary precinct. We had an amazing uh, uh, lineup of guest speakers. We had 25 people join us in person and another 75 people or so join us online. We had a lot of fun with flags and we had a great room overlooking Parliament Hill at the Delta. And in fact, it was our least, most least expensive and most exquisite room that we've ever had. Here's a picture of Gloria Willis. Uh, she gave, a, uh, our friends in Africa gave a wonderful presentation on uh, how they're with us in our journey on creating the political will for a livable world. And uh, something special we did while on Parliament Hill is we built a giant dream catcher, which is an Ojibwe or Anishinaabe symbol that has multiple layers of meaning and Indigenous elder and my friend Will Morin helped us build it. And I'm happy to announce that seven members of Parliament joined us in building this giant dream catcher on Parliament Hill, including one parliamentarian from each of the four major parties in Canada, the Liberals, the Conservatives, the Greens and the NDP. So we had one member from each. Our members are lobbying right now. We're pretty confident by the end of June, they'll have conducted at least 50 lobbying sessions. They've been able to lobby the environment critic from the uh, New Democratic Party, Elizabeth May, the first Green uh, MP ever elected to the House of Commons. 
uh, as well as the second uh, Green MP uh, elected to the House of Commons, Michael Morris, in addition, and they have lobbied various members of Prime Minister Trudeau's cabinet, and it's been a wonderful uh, lobbying atmosphere uh, for us, we, with doors are flinging open and our volunteers are doing fantastic work. Dr. Megan Keda, CCI board member, said something last week that just resonated with me, that we can slow down and move at the speed of light. So that is the central focus of my presentation today. So yes, it's going to go by quickly, but that's what's happening right now. Almost 20,000 people outside the UC, U, USA are CCL supporters. We are organized in 76 countries. 52 countries have active chapters. Canada joined CCL in 2010, and we were the first country to do so. Australia and Sweden in 2013. 13, and by 2015, we were connecting globally. And here's all the chapters around the world. One of the things we started this year was monthly educational calls for our leaders around the world. And we brought in Charles Hodgson from Because IPCC, and he shared a resource with us called Because IPCC. And what it is, is a graphic novel set in the future in a world that is doing very well because we followed the advice of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It gives tremendous background on how the IPCC works and what is contained in there, but it does it in a way that is very friendly to people and gives you great hope. If you want to find out more, please Google because IPCC or scan the QR code or go to this website here. So what is the IPCC telling us? The latest intergovernmental panel on climate change reports confirmed that not only is a rapid pivot off of fossil fuels necessary, but it's entirely possible. Two things that jumped out at me within the IPCC report, especially working group three, was there is sufficient global capital and liquidity to uh, close investment gaps to make this transition possible. And, but the challenge of closing these gaps is widest for developing countries. What is needed is it relies on clear signaling from governments and the international community, including a stronger alignment of public sector finance and policy. So one of those things is carbon pricing. Another is border carbon adjustments, but there's a whole bunch of financial things our governments need to be doing, like regulating the financial sectors and uh, making sure the special drawing rights at the multilateral banks are, are in alignment with the climate. So we need some clear policies. So thank you for working on those policies. COP26 was a whirlwind. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Um, it was emotionally a lot to process, but the great moment of hope came for me when I was in a finance ministers for climate session, um, which it, finance ministers for climate includes the United States of America. And one of the policy uh, persons, um, an economist in there said, progress on climate policy and the transformation of the economy will not be linear. And that moment, I felt great hope. So basically we have to follow the money and we need our leaders to lead and the grassroots need to push them. The G7 and G20 in 2022 are Germany and Indonesia, and they both committed to a climate ambitious G7s and G20s. So we got organized behind the scenes within the civil society networks, including the C7, which is the civil society, um, umbrella group for all, all the civil society groups that um, around the world, as well as the women seven. And we monitored what was happening in the think tank seven and the tried to get in the youth seven, but were unsuccessful, but we monitored it. We monitor what was happening in the, in the, in the science seven and we're also monitoring what's happening in the C20. And I am happy to announce that the Y7, the think tank seven, the science seven, the W7 and the C20 all have very strong statements on carbon pricing in their 
demands to the leaders of the G7 and the G20. The C7 also had a very strong demand uh, that included redirecting financial flows away from fossil fuels and towards a resilient and equitable future, which is an umbrella statement for many ways of following that money that, need, that will transform our economy. And I would just like to take a moment to thank all the people from CCL and CCI that were behind the scenes within these civil society uh, networks. It included people from 10 different countries. And if I name one, I have to name them all. And I just don't have time, but bless you all for your work. That was a lot of fun. And we got stuff done. Another uh, way that we could redirect financial flows uh, to, to consider, um, not that we work on it, uh, uh, quite a bit, but just know that $1.8 trillion or 2% of the global economy includes harmful subsidies um, that are, uh, and they must be redirected towards protecting the climate and nature rather than financing our own extinction. So this was really powerful data coming out of Business for Nature in February of this year. In May, there was a joint declaration following the third EU joint ministerial meeting. And this is Melanie Jolie and Joseph Perel, and they are the foreign affairs ministers for Canada and the European Union. And they are working cooperatively on carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments to prevent carbon leakage in a WO, WTO compatible way. I know most of you know what WTO is, but for those of you who don't, it's World Trade Organization. So this powerful statement came out just three weeks ago. And just last week, Canada and Chile also um, formed an alignment to, to continue um, building carbon pricing uh, alignments uh, within the Western Hemisphere and across the world. Dear CCLers, my name is David Michael Teungwa. I'm the Africa Regional Coordinator for Citizens Climate International. I want to congratulate you all for participating in this year's conference. And to let you know that the seed that Marshall planted and we all have nurtured is yielding fruits around the world and especially in Africa, my continent, and also in my country, Nigeria. For the first time last year in October, we held our first national conference and lobby day. Can I hear you say, yay? Yes, it was a successful lobby day. We lobbied for the passage of the climate change bill in Nigeria. And just two months after that bill was passed and it is now an act in Nigeria called the Climate Change Act. The good news is that the act has a component of carbon pricing in it. So right now, we are lobbying to ensure that the carbon pricing policy that the government of Nigeria should adopt should be the climate income. The importance of climate income or the carbon fee and dividend policy in Nigeria and in Africa and across the world indeed cannot be overemphasized because it is critical to the attainment of the Agenda 30, the Sustainable Development Goals, the eradication of poverty in Africa, to end hunger in Africa and all of that. It is also critical to the attainment of the Agenda 2063 of the African Union. We have made a lot of strides. Although COVID slew us down, but we have picked up and we are moving even faster. Early this year, we held a media round table on the IPCC report, which is part of CCL's policy of working with the media. We got media people to be part of us and after that media roundtable, we got 15 articles plus news, TV news reportage 
of our action. This is the kind of upbeat, no-nonsense, good faith organizing that inspired me the first time I joined CCL in DC. There are moments when it all comes together, but we do this work together because it also takes time and commitment. Since 2014, we have worked in our international program on the civic engagement segment of the UN climate change negotiations. Action for climate empowerment, they call it. This is a commitment by 196 nations to provide climate change education, make climate science available to the public, be transparent about climate policies, engage citizens and communities in the design and implementation of climate policy, and work together to support wider involvement of stakeholders in climate-related decision-making. Together with a community of civic-minded nonprofits from around the world, we have helped to establish a UN-recognized community of education, communication, and outreach stakeholders, ECOS, to advance this civic participation agenda. This year, the Action for Climate Empowerment Hub opened in Bonn to help countries fulfill this commitment to open engagement. At last week's talks, countries blocking progress wanted to close the public engagement process so advocates for it could not participate or observe. They wanted to keep human rights out of the action plan that they're working on. Imagine a government asking people to engage and not agreeing to honor their human rights. An alliance of civic organizations and key governments worked together to change the dynamics of the process last week. The closed meeting was opened. Existing best practices from CCI and the ECOS community and other civic organizations were added to the recommendations for countries to follow in this action plan. And in the formal negotiating process around action for climate empowerment, many countries called for human rights to be central, including some who had previously blocked even the mention of human rights in relation to this part of the process. Marshall Saunders once said his favorite virtue of the CCL model is constancy. It takes time to build alliances. It takes time to listen for what other people value, what they hope to achieve and why. It takes time to make critics into allies. It takes time to take apart a counterproductive status quo. One year before the conference that resulted in the Paris Agreement, we published principles for effective, efficient, equitable carbon pricing. This was the result of work done by volunteers from several countries working every single week in focused meetings, turning insights from the REMI report about carbon fee and dividend into principles that could apply to any policy that claims to do what a good carbon pricing policy should do. The goal was to build common cause with advocates for other modes of carbon pricing, and we never found anyone who didn't agree with our Paris principles. The Paris principles helped build momentum for high standards, but also a clear distinction between emissions trading markets on the one hand and non-market approaches on the other. The rule book for that part of the Paris Agreement was not fully adopted until last November in Glasgow. So it was last week in the first technical workshop since the rules were adopted, where we put forward climate income, your carbon fee and dividend, as one of the standard approaches nations should use. Seven years after Paris and eight years after we got started on this effort, countries asked for help designing carbon taxes that use revenues to enhance local economies and spur sustainable development. The global talks, which cannot impose taxes, have begun working on how to help countries enact policies that align with our Paris principles. It was a long wait, but we found our way around the blockers. And now we can get to work making things work. The political environment right now is not easy. The world is watching and they know that. What you are doing, your efforts to connect with your own representatives in Congress, your local work as volunteer chapters, your patient, determined, persistent actions on the five levers of political will, all of that is an example to the world and the world is cheering you on. When I speak to diplomats whose countries are facing grave and costly climate impacts, and tell them that, more, that, that tens of thousands of trained, coordinated CCL volunteers are working together in local chapters, building relationships with Congress, and that hundreds of you are gathered in DC, even as the world gathers here in Bonn, these hardworking people of conscience who know what is at stake, 
who carry the weight of their country's future, when they hear about you, they are uniformly excited, inspired, motivated, and hopeful. The world is cheering you on. Thank you for being an example of good faith, decent civic engagement, which the world needs so urgently right now. Please welcome Allison Cabisco. Hi there, everyone having a good morning so far? All right. Okay, so just a little bit about how our afternoon will go. So we have breakout sessions following our lunch break. Um, so on page, pages 14 to 16 in your program, take a look at those. So there's three breakout slots and about four to five choices um, per slot. Sorry, we got the schedule coming up in a sec. Um, so take a look at those descriptions. I know there's a lot of choices. So if you're here with some friends, like maybe you split it up so you can fill each other in afterward. Um, but we got some really great people coming in to speak to us from different organizations at each of these breakouts. And then just a reminder, we have our closing keynote tonight, and that will be back here in the Regency Ballroom. So wherever your last breakout is ending at 5 o'clock, just be sure to come back here by 5.15, where we'll be joined by Bill Shireman for our closing keynote session. And then we have our reception here in the Regency Room as well at 7 p.m., and we're still expecting Senator Sheldon Whitehouse to join us. We're going to have hors d'oeuvres and a cash bar, and then the DJ will be playing again, so we'll have some time to dance afterwards, too. And it'll be a really nice way to wrap up our conference. So right after this, we are going to take our group photo outside on the Empire patio. We'll be standing close together and inviting people to remove their masks. So we invite people who are comfortable with this arrangement to join us for this photo. Those who are able to walk and take the stairs, reference the red arrow in this map. So you'll leave the Regency Ballroom, go left. You'll head up to the Ambassador Landing and keep going around that big staircase. And you'll head toward, towards the birdcage walk that you see on this map. You'll go down another small set of stairs. And then you'll see the Empire Room on your right-hand side. So you'll pass where the pool entrance is and the gym. And Empire will be on your right-hand side. So you'll go through the Empire Room, out to the patio, and then we'll have CCL staff there to start to gather us out onto the lawn. We will be on the grass outside uh, the Empire patio. And there's a lot of steps. And you know the grass can be uneven, so just be careful while you're walking. So for those requiring assistance to avoid the stairs, You'll exit the Regency Ballroom and go left. Use the chairlift to get up to that ambassador landing. And the Omnishorm staff member, Jeff Horton, will meet you there right at that chairlift, so where that blue star is on the map. And Jeff will escort you to the Empire patio. You know, feel free to take a picture of this map. It's probably helpful. We'll have staff outside to help you, too. Folks could also take the west elevators, so the green circle on this map, to level 2B going down. Once exiting the elevator, you should see the Empire Room kind of towards your right, kind of at 2 o'clock. So once we're outside, staff will organize us, organize us into rows. We don't want to cut into your lunch break, so please listen to those staff as they organize us so we can get ready. The photographer is going to actually be on the eighth floor balcony, and she's going to be taking the photo from above. So we'll be looking up at the camera. Um, so she'll be far away, but if you can see her, she can see you, and she's got a great camera lens, so she's going to get us all in that photo. So if we can get 500 people out to take a photo in 10 minutes, we could definitely solve climate change. <laughs> So after the photo, um, just make sure that you, you head off to lunch because we got to be back by 1.30. So let's get this done, take our photo, head off to lunch, and come back by 1.30. All right? Yeah. <laughs>